When I was a kid, I was growing up in, on the coast of California, and um, I was basically uh, a country kid, you know, just running around barefoot and, um, you know, going to the beach and all those things that California kids do. Uh, but my sister and my mother were both knitters, and so I was interested in this kind of web of color that they were creating. Um, and there was also a, a couple of people that we had a big restaurant and there was a waiter that worked in a restaurant who was also an incredible knitter and he used to make what we called dump sweaters because he would go to the uh, flea markets and the charity shops and he would just buy old sweaters and unravel them and, and make up these amazing colorful striped sweaters. So that was very interesting to me. Um, but I didn't learn to knit properly until um, I got to England years later and um, was went to a mill where there was some very beautiful yarns in Scotland and just bought the most amazing colors I'd ever seen in my life. And on my way uh, back to London, where I was living at the time, um, I asked a passenger on the train would she teach me how to knit and she did and I made up my first sweater which I took to Vogue magazine and most people know the story of that um, and if they don't I've got a biography that's coming out later this year which will uh, tell all about that uh, but uh, anyway so that when I once I started knitting it was just all of the kind of impressions that I'd had of these people making things and and you know I could see why they were so attracted to this beautiful craft because it is just very tactile and very therapeutic it's just a wonderful wonderful thing to do and as you knit you're you're just expressing yourself and you're also making yourself feel good but you're also uh, for me I can think very imaginative things about pattern and color and pattern is a huge fascination to me so knitting was never about um, beige sweaters or gray sweaters or black sweaters you know that that would just be the death of me if I had to knit a solid color sweater but to make a pattern and to have that pattern grow is just the most thrilling thing in the world uh, particularly you know complicated geometrics or things like that. So I'm still fascinated with it. It is just one of those things that just goes on and on and on being an amazing craft. I came to England in 1964. Um, I, a friend of mine said that he felt that England would be very good for me. And I had been to Europe, but I had missed out England because I figured we all speak the same language, so what's the point? I'm, go I'm going to go somewhere like Italy and uh, France and places like that. What was interesting is that when I finally got to England, it was more exotic <laughs> than any of those places. Um, it was a very, very uh, different society from America. And I just loved it. I, it, it absolutely, the, the humor, the way of looking at things, the old world. What I love is antiques and old world and a respect for what has gone on in the past, which I think as Americans, we're either very romantic about those things or we're busy throwing it out and building something new and just, you know, tearing down our past. Um, so it was very wonderful to go to old villages and towns and see the antique uh eras that went before all of that history and that history of pattern and color and and all of that so um and 1964 of course was an extraordinary time the beatles were just really getting going and uh i love them they just brought such color and life into the world you know i i, I thought to myself it's very funny because I, I i took a trip all around the world after I first was in England for two or three years. I went on an amazing trip, and I heard the Beatles' music 
everywhere, you know, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and all these places that are sort of strangely chaotic. Now, uh, out in the field, you would hear a farmer playing a Beatles song on a transistor radio. It was the most extraordinary thing. <laughs> I, I think that the, the craft of knitting is just one of those amazing things that you are able to rub two sticks together and out comes a magic web. I've said that before, but it, it is deeply, deeply mysterious and fascinating. And how it happens, I don't know. I, I can't understand how this amazing structure is formed, but somehow it is. And it's something that I've been able to perfect just enough. I'm not I'm not a perfect craftsman in, in any way. I make patchwork quilts and I knit and I make rag rugs and I do it all kind of badly, really. And I do needlepoint. I'm not brilliant at it technically. It doesn't interest me to be brilliant technically, but it is a wonderfully satisfying craft. You know, you can jump on a train with a pair of knitting needles and a stack of yarn and knit some amazing thing. You can, you know, on a plane where you lose your whole will to live because you just forget who you are. You're just in this kind of weird space and you're traveling. I mean, I go to places like Australia, New Zealand and Canada and so on. So you're on for hours and hours and hours. Um, tra traveling by plane, it's very easy to sort of lose the thread of life. And somehow the thread of knitting puts you back in touch with who you are. So it's, it's one of those extraordinary things. I, I, it's my best companion when I'm traveling and when I'm in alien worlds, often dealing with the press, sitting in a hotel room, having an uh, interview with somebody. If I can just knit a bit, before and after those kind of experiences. It just makes life more livable. So it's, it's a deeply satisfying craft. Um, I, I've never been shy about, about publicity. Um, one of the things that it, you know, when I first made my first sweater, I went straight to Vogue magazine. It was a terrible mess, you know. There was yarn hanging out of it and, you know, everything else. But I loved it. it. You know, that's one of the things about the male ego, you know. Like, if we make a loaf of bread, we want to frame it. We want to put it in a museum, you know. Whereas women are cooking and doing all those things all of the time, you know. And very few people, um, you know, give them enough praise for it. But I, I was thrilled with my first sweater. I put... 20 colors into it and it was very very strange and wonderful I thought and I took it straight to Vogue magazine they saw the point of it and um, gave me a commission to uh, do something for the magazine so that that went very well so I've never been shy about publicity and you know I've I went to uh, I was doing a needlepoint project where I was actually stitching Pieces. And I got this very excited about the idea of everybody in England contributing to a big tapestry of all the sort of wonderful things that happen in people's lives as a very personal kind of, I was going to call it count your blessings. And I just, I thought it was a wonderful idea. And I, and I went straight to a pebble mill at one and he said, would you be interested in a project like this? And would you help me publicize it? Which they did beautifully. And I got I think it was something like 2,500 little wonderful pictures came to me and I put them all together in this huge tapestry. So um, publicity is very powerful and it's very important. I think if you're going to do something, I feel like I want to reach people. I want to speak about it. I mean, that's partly I do things for myself. I do things a lot for myself. I'm certainly not motivated by money in life but money's important and it comes to you if you're doing the right things I feel you know uh, if, if you if you just do what you really want to do and you do it with passion and you let people know about it 
it brings you the materials you need. And part of that material is money, and part of it is the help of other people, and part of it is, you know, um, actual materials. I mean, uh, you know, hooking up with a yarn company called Rowan and having them supply me with absolutely beautiful yarns and publicizing the designs that I do. I think they're probably the most classy yarn company in in. England, anyway, and I think that they dominate the world. I mean, they're very, very, uh, have a huge profile in America, where there's now tons and tons of knitting going on, and they're one of the definite high-end names. Television is a powerful medium, uh, because you know, we're all very interested in it, and it's very visual. I actually love radio. That's my, my favorite medium. Um, I'm, and I've done a lot of interviews on the radio, and I've, I've uh, been on Woman's Hour and all of those kind of programs and had, had some extraordinary uh, experiences. But um, television is wonderful because it can show you what you're actually talking about. I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words, and it's really true. I mean, if you sit down and just knit a piece and show people, you know, different um, tapestries and big pieces of knitting and so forth, you're <clears throat> demonstrating exactly what you're talking about. Um, I, I think that uh, what, what happened is I went to um, Channel 4, and I asked if they would be interested in doing a series on knitting and the different crafts that I do. And they said, well, you know, go away and put together a portfolio of images. And I'd heard this before from people, you know, and then you do it and nothing happens. So I started putting together a little portfolio and then I thought, oh, they're never going to listen. They're not going to, they're not going to go for this. And I just gave up. And then I went back about a year later and said again that I was interested and I had a better idea because I was just about to bring out a book and I said, you know, this book would be wonderful if we could illustrate it. And the woman at Channel 4 said, where have you been? You were on my yes list and I've wanted you to come. So anyway, that I said, great. She said, just go home and decide who you want to film your series. And I thought of a, a series on painters, English painters, that was just wonderful that I had seen. And I thought, that's the most exciting thing I've seen in television. So I, I went back and I said, I saw this series on painters. Could you find out who made it? And they came back and they said, oh, this strange woman, she's retired. She's not terribly cutting edge. And I said, sounds good to me. I said, uh, what's her name? I'll, I'll phone her up. And I called her up and I said, after... 20 years of watching television, your series on painters is the most sensual and beautiful thing that I've ever seen. And there was this pause, and then she said, balm to the ears. And I thought, how fabulous. This is the woman I want. And she came around, and we talked and talked and talked about how we would do a series. And I said, how do you, how do you go about it? And she said, oh, I tell the producers and the people giving me money and the television channel that I have this big plan and I give them the plan. But on day one, I jump in and I swim for my life. And I thought, I like this woman. Anyway, and so we jumped in and we swam for our lives and we, did, we made this amazing series. What it did, what was interesting, is very few um, women uh, enthused about it. Some did for sure but but men really got excited because i was a man knitting and they they suddenly wanted to do it because they saw this man knitting it each time that that television show would end i would get a call usually from a man saying that's incredibly interesting do you think i could learn to knit how complicated was it how you know how long did it take you etc cetera, etc cetera. so that was a very interesting you know to see all of that um and I think that basically that that television show, uh, one of the things that was very apparent was that it, it doubled the amount of people coming to an exhibition I had at the Victorian Albert Museum because um, we had 
uh, I was the first textile artist to have a one-man show at the museum. And so that was an extraordinary thing. And we had a huge audience for that. I mean, just, I think they doubled the people actually coming to the museum when that show was running. Um, so it was, uh, it was just proved all over again, which I didn't need a proof of, that textiles are very fascinating to people because everybody can do it. Everybody can knit if they just put their mind to it. They can sit down and, I used to say, any idiot can do what I do. I would get letters from people saying, I'm not an idiot and I can't do it. But most people can do it if they, if they calm down and just concentrate. I would love to do more television because, in fact, I wanted to so much, I, I put a big proposal into the BBC to do something. Um, and, and they said, put it in one paragraph, what you're going to do, which I did. And of course they, they turned it down because you can't, you know, the richness of what I want is very difficult to explain. I mean, I, I'm not a good enough writer perhaps to put it into one paragraph. So I just, it, uh, it wasn't interesting to them. So I went, I hired a BBC cameraman and I went to India and Vietnam and I made my own video um, at great expense. I got a couple of people to back it. I mean, we did it for a shoestring, but it was extraordinary. Uh, it was a very, very nice film called Cave's Color Quest, um, which worked very well. Uh, and we were able to sell that to different people when I came. I took it to the BBC and I said, this is what I'm talking about. Are you interested now? And they said, no, we're not. So that's very, very sad. Uh, but I would love to do more television. And I think that, you know, for instance, take any part of the world. I mean, you could go into a concrete prison and show people where there's inspiration in shades of gray or whatever. There's not a place on this earth that couldn't be explored for fantastic inspiration and ideas for designing and for designers and for people who just want to play with crafts. And so I think that, you know, I would love to see a, a, a film company get behind that and, and really explore the inspiration in England or anywhere else, you know, travel to f exotic places and see that too. <laughs> I would say that my my passion for pattern actually is very very deep. It it it's it's very interesting. I heard a painter on the radio speaking the other day that patterns are so important to us psychologically. We're made out of patterns. You know, we have a symmetry to our faces and everything else. He was saying, you know, if you actually, you know, we have a mirror image face. We have two eyes and two nostrils and two ears and everything else. But if you actually took a photograph and split the face in half and just repeat the other one exactly the same, it's weird and it makes, it's nightmarish. So it's not a perfect symmetry. It's a wonderful human uh, nature's symmetry, which is just full of, of difference. And that's what's so fascinating about patterns is I'm particularly fascinated by the way Africans or Guatemalans or something, the more sort of what we call primitive societies play with pattern, where it's very warm and very human and uh, full of incident and, and, and changes and it's not strict and machine made. It's a very, very uh, organic kind of approach to pattern. So I'm fascinated uh, with pattern and I always have been. And uh, I think that when you start to play with textiles, it lends itself to uh, the exploration of pattern because, you know, it's the way, the vehicle for color. Color, of course, is the biggest passion of my life. But if color isn't organized into some kind of pattern, even if it's just enormous squares or great big stripes of color, it's color's relationship to something that makes it thrilling 
that makes us sit up and take notice of it. If you just put out a field of red, if there's not an edge to that field, it's very difficult to digest it as a human being. But the minute you organize it, squares of red, checkerboards of red, um, red and fuchsia, red and green, red and black, you know, it's whatever. You start to see red. You see the deep possibilities of it in a very different way. And so that's, it, color and pattern are the most endlessly fascinating subjects in the world. The whole subject of crafts is extremely interesting because the minute you start to play with crafts, if you are an artist, as I started out being an easel painter, fine artist, people say, well, is it art? And of course, that's a question that gets thrown at you all the time. And I, I, I say, well, that's, you know, that's not for me to say, you know, to me, it is. I'm, maybe I'm just full of myself and I'm, you know, have too much self-importance. But I think it's significant what I'm doing. I'm playing with the relationship of patterns. To me, that's what fascinates me in art. When I look at art, if, if it's, there's got to be some kind of um, sense and order and pattern to it to, to intrigue me and bring my mind into it. And so I'm fascinated by what I'm discovering as a knitter. Um, and, you know, I suppose if I were a different kind of artist, I would, like Tracy Emin or something, I would be taking those and putting them up on walls and showing them like art. I actually do. I mean, I have exhibitions all the time in museums and things, and I suppose I am highlighting a quilt or a great big throw, knitted piece of pattern. Um, I, I, they're as satisfying to me as paintings. When I very first saw patchwork quilts, the old American ones, and I would see the way people were playing with pattern together and textures and color, I was far more fascinated with that than almost any painter I could think of. And then, you know, later when I would see paintings that looked like textiles, I was more interested in the painting. So, I don't know whether it's art. I do, you know, that's a definition that the critics will have to deal with. the most powerful thing about knitting is that it makes you happy to be in your own company. And that's a huge thing. A lot of people are very, very nervous of being alone in life. Uh, I love to be alone. Of course, I'm never quite alone. I've got Radio 4 on <laughs> most of the time, and I'm sort of listening to other people's poetry and thoughts and plays. As a friend, you know, a painter friend of mine said, oh, I love plays on the BBC, you know, the chink of teacups. And I, I just thought, it's so true, you know, that you picture and you make these sets and these emotional kind of images of, of what's going down on the radio. But anyway, um, for me to be able to sit and make something, even just very quietly, just go to a park, say, or as as I say, traveling on planes and things, long hours, just being able to put together these beautiful, this material of, of wool that came off a sheep's back, or silk that came from a cocoon, or cotton that came from something that was organic and grown, and the, the way color is different if it's in mohair or silk or cotton or wool. So all you you have all this kind of different textures of color coming together and making your choice of combination and pattern. It is, I mean, there's just nothing in the world like it. It is better than anything in this world. And I'm a very sensual person. I love sex and eating and, um, traveling and, um, you know, uh, the theater. I love, there are many things that I love in life. 
But the act of being able to just take yarn and create something is very, very high in the um, collection of life's delights. My favorite things to make are just great big sheets of pattern, you know. I love to just cast on and make a big shawl or a, or a great big throw for a couch. Not have to worry, you know, is it just the shape of someone's little body and have bust darts and armholes and, you know, buttonholes and all that stuff. You know, I, I, that doesn't interest me at all. It, it sort of does. I mean, you know, I love to see a, a nice garment on someone. But basically, what I like is a big field of pattern. And it, it, the bigger the better, you know. So that's my favorite thing to make, is to cast on and make a blanket or a, a great big throw for a couch. What has always fascinated me about knitting is that it, it, it is this wonderful craft which should involve anyone's mind who's interested in pattern and color, uh, even if you want to knit solid things or whatever. So it never had a sort of sexual feeling to me. It wasn't like something that was very feminine or very masculine. It was just, you know, a way of solving a pattern of making your own little picture of a combination of colors and shapes. Uh, and I couldn't understand why that would belong to the realm of women. But, you know, looking at history and realizing uh, that there was a period in history when men did the knitting, and uh, then it, it may, I don't think women were even allowed to do it at one point. Um, and then it became absolutely the woman's thing and it was you know uh it was the domestic craft that a woman made sitting at the hearth or you know tending her children and and knitting up a little booty for the children or whatever and so it became this very very um feminine motherly kind of um occupation and and also when i learned to knit i was on a train uh you know <laughs> in public so I right from the word go I was out of the closet you know there was no way I was going to hide and also I wasn't going to waste hours and hours and hours of public traveling not knitting just simply because it was not a thing that a guy did so I, I was trying to break that stereotype uh, and challenge it for sure um, and so it's never been a thing to me and what's interesting is that when I'm traveling, very often men will watch and be very interested in what I'm doing. And one day a guy said to me, sitting in a plane, you know, we were traveling for hours. He said, I've been watching you knit and you really do that professionally. And I said, well, it is my profession. I'm a designer. And he said, gosh, he said, I should learn to do that. It would be very good for me, for the job I do. And I said, what job do you do? He said, I'm a train driver. I love the idea of him sitting in his cab of his train, you know, belting through some landscape, knitting away. Um, but anyway, so I've had a lot of interest from men. Occasionally, the the people that will be very shocked that I'm knitting and, and say, I've never seen a man do that, are women. And so I, I do get a lot of uh, sort of adverse reactions from women, but never from men. I think knitting the way I do is extremely good for men. It, it's solving problems of pattern and structure. And most men have a very, very architectural mind. They have a way of being fascinated by the structure. They can analyze. I mean, when a man comes and looks at my knitting, he'll, he'll say, oh, I see how that works. That's tumbling blocks. That's a diamond which is going into another diamond, which is creating this illusion. They analyze it very quickly. Uh, it's not the way a woman approaches things, as far as I can see. You know, when I'm teaching women, it's a lot, it's very different for them to come to terms with what, how that structure 
grows. They don't analyze it in the same way. So we just have different, we're just wired differently. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing for a man, particularly if you're going to knit patterns. When I first started knitting, I, I used to say, this is going to change the world. Everyone's going to catch on to this and there's going to be peace. It's going to rain. Everyone's going to be happy. Oh, it's the answer to everything. Well, it wasn't for years. It just, and particularly the way I knit really scared people. But what happened is that there's a, there was a group of people in America that began to get excited about knitting. And what they did was they went out and they found celebrities that knitted and they really tooted the horn saying, you know, did you know that so-and-so actress is knitting and, you know, and seen on the set of so-and-so that another actress was knitting. And so when they started making it very, very sexy and uh, glamorous, and they also, uh, the Yarn um, Institute of America or something, I can't remember what they're called, uh, but they, they, uh, started knit outs, which was taking over a whole street, say in Los Angeles or New York or Boston. And like in Boston, they took over a whole train station and they had a big festival of knitting. And they had all the older women come down, teach the younger gals how to knit. They had lots of giveaway yarn. Uh, everybody was talking knitting. And, you know, they made it exciting. They made it a, a jamboree. You know, and they have fashion shows and music and lots of good food and stuff. And it, it was fun. It, it, it just became um, a kind of entertainment. And I think that's what got people into it. And then once they were into it, of course, they discovered, like we all do, us knitters, that it's the most satisfying and wonderful thing. And so, um, but I think that from my own viewpoint, there still is a lot of timidity about working with patterns. They think it's too complicated. And um, I wish that they would get over that. Meanwhile, I'm just glad people are knitting because it's a great thing to do. It's, you know, people ask me, is it going to last? You know, is, is it going to phase out? Is it just something we're going through? I think that with the internet and everything and digital world, it's all moving very, very fast. You know, you're sitting there thrumming your desk if you haven't had an answer from your email in two seconds. You know, what's the matter with people? You know, so it's all going very, very fast. And this is a way of slow cooking, of slowing down, getting back in touch with yourself, what's real. The great thing about the internet is they can teach people, A, that everyone's doing it. It's a great thing to do. Here's the reviews of all these people, the satisfaction, the happiness that they've got. It's instant. Here's where you buy the yarn. Here's where you buy the needles. Here's what's available. All these new colors coming out of the market, these new textures and things. So I can't imagine that it wouldn't just go on and on and on, getting better and better. Um, it. It is so portable. It's such a great thing to do. Um, I hope it keeps going. But if it doesn't, I suppose they'll find something else. But I, I really do feel it has a great uh, future. It'll go on. Mm -hmm.